I hope you all had a good tea and you're back to listen some listen to some new ideas. Um, so let us start with our young scholars and their presentations. Our first uh, first presentation for today is by Ms. Steffi Anthony and Ms. Steffi Anthony. Uh, she is uh, the paper has been worked on with uh, Dr. P. S. Ranjit from they are from the Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation. And they are presenting on the effect of fiscal deficit, uh, fiscal limits on subnational spending in India. Yeah, so we had a call for paper, and uh, uh, so we received abstracts and we did blind reviews, and uh, then we identified these papers. So, so just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah. So we have three presentations. One is from CBPS, uh, Young Scholars, and two from outside. So good afternoon, all. Uh, I'll be presenting on the effects of fiscal limits on subnational spending in India. 15 minutes max. Yeah, I'll try. OK. So fiscal management is believed to be important for any country to bring about fiscal discipline. Countries over the years have adopted at least one fiscal austerity measure to bring in this discipline. Especially in the context of India, literature show that these rules were successful in bringing down the deficits of both center and state governments. It is important to look at how expenditure patterns behave with fiscal rules and limits, as these patterns are believed to be outcomes of a rule-based fiscal regime. Uh, the most common ways of achieving uh, the limits are either by cutting down the expenditures or enhancing the revenues. So here we are looking at the expenditure part and how the fiscal rule have affected the expenditure part of governments. Uh, so, the devolution of fiscal authority to subnational governments has thrown light to the importance of high subnational deficits. IMF defines fiscal rules as long-lasting constraints on fiscal policy through numerical limits on deficit reduction, balancing the budget, or controlling the spending. According to OECD report, as of end 2021, almost 105 economies have gone for at least one fiscal rule. And uh, most of the fiscal consolidation episodes relied more on uh, expenditure reduction rather than boosting the revenues. Uh, if you look at the European uh, experience of fiscal consolidation, for example, you can find that they had uh, two dimensions uh, during uh, one during the 1980s, another one during the 1990s. So during the 80s, they adopted a revenue enhancing mechanism by increasing the tax mostly uh, which the burden fell on the households and social, social security contributions. And this increase in taxes were accompanied by expenditure cuts on public investments. But the government wages and transfers uh, were left intact. That is, the revenue part, uh, revenue expenditure part was not touched upon. Uh, during the next decade, the countries modified their fiscal consolidation strategies, focusing mostly on uh, reducing the uh, spending on transfers, social security, and government salaries and pension. Uh, literature showed uh, that the adjustment strategies adopted by nations uh, during 1990s were more lasting and expansionary than the one which was followed during the previous decade. That, was, uh, th that means that the expenditure compressing mechanism was uh, more relevant than uh, the revenue enhancing ones. Uh, the, sorry. Uh, the advantages of having a fiscal rule in place are transparency, effectiveness in addressing the sustainability and equity problem, and so on. And the disadvantages are the trade-off between compliance and flexibility, uh, lack, of, uh, uh, lack of flexibility during economic downturns, etc. Now, India, during a phase of fiscal stress, adopted uh, a rule-based fiscal framework, further prompting the state governments to adopt FRL. Now, if you look, when such rules are adopted at the subnational level, it affects the composition of public spending, and states uh, who have limited revenue raising capacity would curtail uh, the expenditure, especially the development expenditure, because state governments more or less depend on the uh, central government for their revenue needs. Because of their low tax compliance and weak tax administration, their ability to raise revenue is restricted. Uh, revenue expenditure cannot be curtailed as it consists of salaries, pensions, subsidies, etc., cutting off which will have both political and economic implications. Now, weak electoral accountability for public good provisions will encourage states to compromise on capital spending, spending on short-term rather than long-term investments. But as mentioned earlier, raising tax revenue is challenging for the SNGs given the many constraints that it faces. 
Now we look at how the fiscal consolidation has evolved at the state level in India. In Indian context, during the early phase of fiscal reforms, the revenue to GDP ratio declined and the pressure of adjustment was solely on the expenditure, resulting in the shortfall of capital expenditure. The, more or, uh, the country more or less had an incentive-based fiscal consolidation linked with a rule-based uh, fiscal framework based on the 12th Finance Commission recommendations. The limits were kept both on uh, fiscal deficit and revenue deficit. Uh, here we are concentrating more on the fiscal deficit. Uh, the FRBM was adopted in India primarily to reduce deficits and bring about fiscal discipline. It is commonly believed that such a rule-based fiscal framework has helped in bringing down the fiscal deficit of states. Uh, there were large disparities in the growth uh, of receipts and expenditure for the state governments, and this was mainly due to uh, the growing interest burden, increasing pension liabilities, unrestrained administrative expenditure, etc. Uh, so fiscal consolidation was reinforced to the states through fiscal responsibility legislation, and most of the states, states actually adopted FRLs during different time periods, range, ranging from 2002 to 2010, Karnada, Karnataka being the first nation to adopt, and West Bengal being the last. Uh, so... But most of the states, if you look, adopted during the period 2005-06. So fiscal imbalance at state level was brought down during this period of fiscal consolidation. If you look at the graph, it is evident. Uh, the blue line shows the combined fiscal deficit. The orange one shows centers uh, fiscal deficit. And the gray line shows states fiscal deficit. So soon after the implementation of fiscal consolidation measures, uh, the states, uh, both states and center were able to bring down uh, their deficits. And later, during the after 2008, you can find that uh, there was a suspension phase of FRBM due to the global uh, recession. Uh, so it kind of uh, increased the fiscal deficit. Uh, so uh, that uh, the chart makes it very evident. Uh, now, if you look at the literature part, uh, Parameshwar taking evidence from Maharashtra notes that the budgetary allocations to the social sector as a whole have been affected after the FRBM and the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission as these are mainly incurred by the state governments. Now, if you look at the study that uh, did by uh, Roy and Kocha during 2018, they find that the success of fiscal consolidation means that the states have given up their fiscal space to their center, to the center and, their, and this limited their ability to spend more on critical areas. An infrastructural investment gap of uh, more than 5,000 billion was found in the 12th plant period uh, based on a study done by Ramu and Gayatri. They also argue uh, that there would be no harm even if the deficit crosses 3%, given it is spent on capital expenditure. As we all know, there is this multiplier effect that is happening in the economy, uh, which uh, could benefit the economy in the long run. Now, uh, Patak in his paper 2017 found out that there was a reduction in states' total spending and that the states have tried to improve revenue collections after the adoption of FRBM. Now, uh, coming to my part of the analysis, I've tried to put this in a kind of metrics where you can find the relation between FD and the development expenditure. So uh, this could be explained like this, like even if your fiscal deficit is greater than 3% or less than 3%, but you're able to uh, bring up your development expenditure, then you, the state can be said to be in a sustainable fiscal position. Otherwise, not. So that is how this metrics is, uh, can be explained. Uh, so the data and methodology, uh, Sorry. Shall I? Uh, so the data and methodology is that I've uh, considered 18 non-special category states uh, for the analysis, and the period is taken uh, from 2005-06 to 1920. So it's a 15-year time period that is being taken. The key dependent variables are development expenditure, capital expenditure, and revenue expenditure. And a variable fiscal gap score was assessed. This was assessed taking the difference between the actual FD and the 3%. That is the limit. Uh, so this is the model, and here uh, the FPIT uh, is the variable showing the positive fiscal gap score. G is the income growth rate, uh, L is the lump sum transfers, and R is the effective interest rate. Uh, growth rate is taken uh, in as it is a proxy uh, to the business cycle, and actually this model is adopted... Uh, is based on a 2005 paper, which was done by Chakrabarti and Dash, where the authors tried to find the relation between fiscal rule and development spending. So um, I have not taken all of the variables. I have included uh, the in uh, per capita income growth rate, the uh, lump sum transfers, and the effective interest rate. Uh, lump sum transfers and effective interest rate uh, can have, uh, believing that it can have an uh, effect on the fiscal position. Now these are the aggregate regression results with the calculated with the fiscal gap score. Uh, and 
these are the results based on the uh, positive fiscal gap dummy because we have taken this to find out how the states with positive uh, fiscal deficit uh, have uh, performed in different indifferent to the uh, states with negative fiscal gap score so uh, here you can find that uh, our square value being uh, low because uh, the independent variables are only this much defining the dependent variable uh, i have not taken all other variables uh, maybe more variables included uh, would increase the r square value uh, now if you look at the uh, results with the fiscal gap score when there's an increase in the fiscal gap score all the components of expenditure increases and if you look at the results with fiscal score dummy you find that when we compare states with fiscal uh, positive fiscal score to rest of the states an increase in fd leads to a rise in development expenditure and for a further analysis at a disaggregate uh, i've gone for a disaggregate level analysis uh, to see the state wise effect so states with a positive fiscal gap score who on an average has increasing fiscal deficit has a rising development expenditure as fiscal deficit escalates and rest of the states who on an average has a negative fiscal gap score show a rise in components of expenditure except for karnataka uh, there are studies that stress on this fact that karnataka being a uh, uh, being uh, successful in limiting their fiscal deficit was not able to bring up uh, their capital expenditure so there are literature supporting this now out of the 18 states considered for analysis only 6 states have their average fd above the limit almost all the states were able to bring down their deficits now uh, their responsiveness of different components of expenditure to the changes in fiscal deficit was done using the marginal effects to see how the dependent variables change uh, when the fiscal deficit changes so uh, the relation is quite evident from the graph the first showing the relation between fd and development expenditure the second showing uh, the relation between fd and capital expenditure and the third the relation between fd and revenue expenditure so development expenditure and revenue expenditure shows uh, that as, as your fd goes up to a point your both your uh, development expenditure and uh, revenue expenditure increases but after a point it falls but capital expenditure do have a positive relation now to conclude as evident from literatures states are often overpowered with high spending responsibilities whereas their revenue raising capacity is limited fiscal rules on and above such constraints can harness development this results indicate that fiscal gap score has a positive relation with all the categories of expenditure but the disaggregated picture of states irrespective of having a positive or negative average fiscal gap score shows development expenditure on the rise the findings however convey the facts that fiscal deficits enhance expenditures especially development and capital so in this context the numerical targets set on deficits are worth investigating so this is a paper under work so i'll be looking for more suggestions and comments from your part thank you isn't it question yeah. huh? i think question yeah see these three papers are uh, i mean they all are part of the say public finance and governance but they are quite different from each other so i think it's better to take questions for 10 minutes and then go to the next paper that that will make more sense please just a clarification yes so if the r square is so low what does that mean uh, what do you consider to be the important variables that left out uh, i was there any any type of speculation not even based on the data analysis i'm not criticizing it but yes. when you find r square to be so low it is something that is worrying all the efforts that you are putting to find explanation for the uh, set pattern maybe there are a lot of control variables that i have to take into consideration uh, before modeling this i've left uh, because there'll be more variables that could be affecting uh, the uh, variables of interest that i'm speak talking about uh, so i've just considered the per capita growth rate the lump sum transfers and the effective interest rate so i guess i'll have to consider uh, more uh, if you have any suggestions based on that like what all other variables I, that i could include you use spss you use spss i used that? stata for the analysis acha okay no because you know you can have alternative variables and data and try to see that what are the effect and uh, through a process of taking 10 or 15 variables you can come to the variables and then run a correlation analysis of the independent variables and then you can fix the variables that will be selected for the analysis final one because you know if you want to develop this as a paper this will be a question that will be coming up thank you 
Thank you, sir. CAG. CAG. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so to, I mean, uh, restate your conclusions, you know, in my own words, what you said is that where the fiscal deficit increases, I mean, that means where you're not uh, limiting yourself by the fiscal uh, limit, which means that you are uh, borrowing more or you're raising more, uh, mm -hmm. borrowing more actually, if it, since it's a deficit. So like as I say, the rising tide lifts all boats. So if you're increasing the envelope, so all expenditure would go, do go up, right? I and mean, whether it is revenue, capital, or development. So that seems like a very obvious, um, uh, what do you call, consequence of raising expenditure. But even if you look here, the states with negative fiscal gap score were also kind of having an increase in development expenditure. Sorry, uh, can uh, you come again? Like, even those who are limiting, uh, who are having a less than 3% on an average fiscal deficit, even they were having a rising uh, development expenditure uh, as per the data. Maybe because the independent variables that are being included are not. So I think what perhaps needs explanation is that uh, which one is going up more uh, in relation to the other and what would be the underlying factors for that, right? I mean, like, you know, when expenditure is going up, all, the, all of them are going up, right? Yes. Revenue, as, revenue would go up a little less because less. revenue is much more committed. You know, it's a committed expenditure, so it would not raise as much because it's not really dependent on additional funding. Whereas capital and uh, development expenditure, to some, capital expenditure certainly is more. That's why you see capital expenditure going up. So I th maybe it requires a, perhaps a deeper analysis to see what is actually happening. I mean, that's should I look into it? Thank you. Share, share. For many a time, for capital expenditure, the base is very small. So therefore, it will be highly exaggerated in terms of percentages. If you take the absolute number, the result may be doubt. Uh, okay. Maybe different. I'll so you may t you try it. You know. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Just take five minutes only in the computer. And just try yeah, alternative it. variables and then come to the important variables. Thank you. Thanks. It's just um, following up on comments made earlier. Um, I think if you have uh, an R squared of point 0.1 and 0 0.06, it's a non-starter. It really means that whichever specification you're using, either you're missing out too many things or it's misspecified in some form so that your collective explanation from all your variables which you include in the model are not explaining what you're wanting to look at. So from there, if you derive all these conclusions, they actually, it's not worth pursuing in that way because they don't have that sort of reliability about it. My own feeling is that perhaps from all the, you know, you have a command over the data and you have the data and you're looking at all these relationships. Forget about the econometrics of it. Uh, this kind of econometrics in a relatively simple model uh, are best applied when you want to get numerical values for relationships which you have independently established as being strong relationships in terms of directions, affinities, and so on. So I would say you look at these variables in a more simple way. Uh, look at two or three variables that see how the thing works. Get the explanation right. Look at the series, examine them for quite a while. I mean, some of the most famous economy people who in applied economics used to look at graphs and scatters before they actually went to the actually <laughs> estimations. Here you're doing it in reverse. You see you're, you're getting trapped by the method because you have the equation and then you are looking for the explanation in the equation. Look for the explanation first independently then and when you have that, you will also know what variables are missing. And then I'm sure your R squares or whatever your parameters will change. That was my suggestion. Mm. I mean, I, it's not a criticism, I but I think your work is halfway going in that direction. But I wouldn't stop here. Please don't stop I here. No, no, sir. Yeah. Just to say that I think um, I think the question that you're trying to understand is a useful one. I think we're all grappling with limited revenues. Um, th there's an entire center state element of it, which you also alluded to. Um, this big debate about if center has a is allowed a higher fiscal deficit, what about states? Um, so I think the, the 
the premise of the starting point is a really useful one because it's a very topical thing where we do need to look at what does constraint revenues uh, mean for expenditures, whether it's re revenue expenditure, capital expenditure, dev development expenditure. But I think I would agree with um, um, the other comments is don't get too technical. Uh, let's literally, one of the things that we do when you have streams of data is just spend hours just looking at the trends and patterns. We draw trend lines, we draw scatter plots, um, and see if you can scat something there. Because you're, you are limiting yourself by a model which may or may not tell you the whole thing. Some of, one of the biggest challenges, I don't know about you, if, that we found with public finance is that at the end, end of the day, you have limited variables. <laughs> um, there are, if you, if you take every single state in the country, there are still only so many states, even if you take time series data, there is um, only so, so many years. So um, don't get trapped by your model, but um, but I think it's a really interesting idea of saying what, is, what does constraint revenues mean for how states or even how priorities are set um, in some ways. And so it will be great to see more work around that area. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and I think also uh, literature. It's, it's good to look at not only the literature that's dealing with us, like India, but also a larger set of literature that will give you insights in terms of you know what more to look at, even in terms of data, what more correlations to try, what are the variables. What. So I think uh, uh, one message is that, that first understand the relationship and then play with data. Isn't it? That, that's, that's what, rather than trust your data first and arrive at a conclusion. Yeah, <laughs> so that is it. Yeah, use the, so don't get lost in the technical side of it. Understand the relationship well, and then you uh, apply your techniques. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I'd like to call upon uh, Sneha Sharma and Parth Chaturvedi from the Indian School of Public Policy. They are presenting their paper, this management and governance of citizen data in the new normal. Good evening, everyone. I am Sneha Sharma. And I'm Parth Chaturvedi from the Indian School of Public Policy. We are currently pursuing our post-graduation in policy making, design and management. We stand here to present our paper on governance and management of citizen data. Uh, where we'll discuss with you the importance of data management and the importance of governing by data and how it is different from data governance and what the governments are doing currently. In the early 18th and the 19th century, the most important resources that countries fought over was land. Land gave them their identity and therefore most of the wars fought were over land, territory expansion. It later changed to natural resources like water and oil. And today, as we stand in the 21st century, or also called as the digital century, we see that the digital data ecosystem of a country, the data a country holds, is the most important resource a country uh, can have. You know, it is often said that governance has changed over the years, but the governance models have not changed. We have transitioned from having physical data to digital data, but the models of our governance from being traditional to ad adopting to that change have also not changed. And it is also being claimed that now we don't need modern weaponry to attack a nation. And we recently saw how cyber attacks and attack on a country's data ecosystem can be a big threat to a country. This attack can not only have a domino effect on, say, a sector, but a spillover effect on the entire economy and all the sectors, and also cross the boundaries of a nation. Data today is considered to be the oil of 21st century. Just like oil, it is extremely valuable, and it, if not refined and not managed properly, it can render no use. But it is slightly different from oil as well. It is unlimited, ever-growing, and omnipresent. And therefore, management of data becomes of paramount importance. Yeah, when we talk, when we talk about citizen data, we all know that the citizen data, both personal as well as non-personal, can have varied use and, and, and have a huge impact on governance. And if that is used judiciously, and as it enables the creating in creating an evidence-based approach to running administrative machinery more efficiently, more um, uh, sustainably, and transparently. 
in our prep, in our paper in our, uh, we have come up with two specific recommendations uh, to improve the ways governments can better use data uh, in governance and service delivery as well and uh, at the end of our presentation we'd like to uh, talk about the outcomes that our recommendation might have so the indian government has been collecting and storing citizen data for varied purposes in over a lot of years now we've been collecting data to issuing identity cards to tracking fin financial transactions and this slide over here displays the increasing uh, digital infrastructure in the country we have seen that 2.6 billion terabytes of data was generated in india in 2020 and this is expected to grow over the years from 2020 to 2025 um, like last week, um, Minister of uh, State Rajiv Chandrasekhar presented a report and he said that at present government is investing 100,000 crore rupees on equipping the digital infrastructure in the country and they aim to adding on to another 13,000 crore infrastructure in the new year, uh, in the coming years. Now one problem that happens with these growing numbers is that we tend to narrow it down to only a few topics here. Uh, with these growing numbers, uh, concern, there are concerns on the management and governance of data that we often overlook. And when citizens are actually involved in data governance, we only look at it from a tangent of data security and privacy issues. And uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, in 2018, we saw the largest Aadhaar data leak of billions of citizens in the country, which was available on WhatsApp through an anonymous number in just 500 rupees. And what could be done was sensitive information of these citizens could be leaked out to people whom it should not be with. Aadhaar is also important in this structure because it is one point of contact for, for the governments now to deliver all, almost all the social welfare schemes. Therefore, it is important that we create a, a robust infrastructure, a do, robust digital infrastructure, which makes sure that these uh, instances don't happen. Also, as in the previous sessions also, we were discussing that the the methods of governance is still very archaic and traditional. So what we while we were researching on the topic, we realized that the governments are following a very traditional uh, method of governance where they have not transitioned from a data, uh, um, physical data dominance, the dominance of physical data to a dominance of digital data. So we, we came up with two, uh, we came across two certain two concepts. The first is the um, data governance, governing data, and the other is governing by data. So we need to understand the difference between the two. The first is uh, the governing data, which we under, which we believe is the more traditional way of uh, governance. In in that, what happens is the governments usually uh, follow a very uh, linear and a mechanical way of uh, governance, and uh, where we. Where, we, uh, where they usually focus on the data collection and the data dissemination, data usage part. What happens is the planning and the uh, the planning and designing facet of the of the policy making and of the governance is usually missed out on. So b because of this, even the storage and the data analysis part is not not very effective. One reason of one reason for this, what we realized is that the government the governments usually consider citizens as the end of governance and not as a means of governance. So we realize that uh, because of this, and, and this actually leads to uh, sometimes missing to, to the lack, there's a lack of uh, adherence to democratic principles. Because when we talk about governance, it involves the citizens at the center. The data that is, collect, that is being collected is of citizens. The governance is being done for citizens, and yet citizens are not at the center of policy making. So that is what we understood is an issue. So, um, and therefore, governments usually end up governing data and not governing citizens. So one example that we came, what we can think of is the uh, Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, the ABDM mission. So what the, what the government is currently trying to achieve is the interoperability of data. So you, what happens is uh, at the uh, government hospital levels, the private, government, private hospitals, and um, at various uh, levels of uh, hierarchy, the data is very scattered and is present in silos. It is not interoperable. So government is trying to, and what I'm pretty sure my, many of you might not even know this, that as of half an hour before we speak, 34, more than 34 crores of di unique digital IDs have been created by the government, which the citizens are not aware of. And I'm pretty sure that if we move out, out of the gate, we, if we ask a common man, he would not know he has a digital, unique digital ID. 
So therefore, we, it, it proves, my, proves our point that citizens are not at the center of policy making and policy governance as of now. So one way of doing this, of uh, getting rid of this point, is governing by data. That is uh, bringing the citizen into the center of policy and governance, and therefore uh, that, that will actually help in, um, uh, uh, that will actually result in an evidence-based evidence -based approach in the policy and in governance uh, to make to uh, enable us to make um, better informed decisions which are based on data and uh, facts and not on our assumptions and beliefs and this was, this would al also help us ensuring transparency and accountability and uh, uh, transparency and ac accountability in the system also it would and therefore it would he help in uh, uh, improving the service delivery of the government and uh, Another the one, we have one very simple feed, uh, simple um, solution for this. A simple, simple recommendations that in this data cycle, which uh, which usually uh, appears to be a very linear and mechanical, if we add a feedback mechanism, which is usually not present in the data cycle in India, then at that um, at that point of time, we can have a good data cycle, where and feedback mechanism can also be included at as a spoke at every node. So after data collection, there should be a feedback mechanism. After data st storage also, there we should be informed at every stage of what the data, uh, how the data is being used. And that would, uh, that would help government in uh, saving a lot of resources. Because uh, if we t uh, take the example of the data protection bill of 2019, what actually happened was the government came out with a bill which was not very uh, informed, which did not have prior stakeholder consultations, and therefore, it, it um, faced confrontation not from only from the corporate side, but also from the citizen side. And ultimately, they had to resort to the feedback mechanisms, and therefore, they ultimately uh, came out with a new legislation. So the planning, designing, if that planning, designing, and the disposing of data could have been earlier done, then a the lot of resources would have been saved. Uh, so like my co-author has already spoken about the democratic principles and the need for citizen-based governance. Uh, these are just some additional points. Uh, when you get uh, citizens into the center of governance and when they know that what the data is being used for and what is the framework about, there is a trust which builds between the citizens and the government and there is no scope for authoritarianism. Because at present when we read about such things, we tend to take it to privacy and other issues and we don't think of it from a governance lens. And therefore involving citizens in data governance and management can lead to a more realistic approach to project management and we'll be able to complete uh, and be, uh, execute more policies more efficiently. Uh, like we've spoken about two broad case studies uh, in our paper. One is the Aadhaar data leak and second is the personal data protection bill. Uh, both the case studies have some common threads of challenges that India currently faces in um, its digital public infrastructure. And we have listed a few challenges right here. What happens is, like we've spoken in the earlier sessions today as well, that the union government vests a lot of power when it comes to collecting data. And since it's just one agency, no matter how much power and resources the union government have, they lack the power to track real-time data. They don't have enough resources. India is a diverse nation, and therefore to get real-time resources, you need to reach out to the right uh, authorities and the right level of governance, as is also been mentioned in the principle of uh, subsidiarity. Uh, for this, uh, just to adapt and to evolve what is happening in India currently, we have two broad recommendations. One is to change the idea of the bottom, uh, one is to adopt the idea of the bottoms up approach from centering all the powers to the union government. We need to make sure that the data is collected at the grassroots level. One very interesting example of what the government recently has done is that they, for the uh, Jal Jeevan mission, they have created a very unique dashboard where you can find data of every district and every block on the government website. And local level governments are given the power to put that data across there. So in just in that case, you get real time data and you get data that is reliable uh, for policy making. Yeah, the other, sorry. The other is obviously the interoperable part of it. Because as we as I talked about the ABDM, so again, what happens is in ABDM, the it, in terms of the benefits to the citizen, what usually happens is if I get, if I we came from Delhi, 
So if I had some procedure done, uh, done in Delhi, and if I came to Bangalore for testing, I would have to uh, produce my data and give, get the test ag done again in Bangalore. That is what we are trying to pretend in, in terms of service delivery. If the data is, has, had been interoperable and uh, we had known about the interoperability of data and that uh, the data actually exists, in that, way, in that manner, there, uh, if uh, we could have uh, saved a lot of time and energy of the government and resources. So uh, in, in, uh, in that aspect, uh, how the, the three basic uh, benefits that the interoperability can have. One is the experience to the citizens that I've mentioned. The other is the improvement in, in, in the administration machinery, administrative machinery. How that can be done is usually what uh, over the years have been done is uh, the, the government officers have to go to places to collect, to collect data. And there are a lot of departments, there are a lot of uh, redundancy of data. So if the data is interoperable, uh, there would be uh, uh, the the uh, the work that is done is would be quite efficient. Uh, the service delivery would be very very efficient. And the third is data privacy also uh, uh, outcome of data interoperability. Uh, in the way that currently the data is in the hands of a lot of people. When data is interoperable, the the number of people that actually holds and command the data, citizen data, becomes quite less. And uh, to sum up. Uh, interoperability of data that uh, we have uh, identified three ways of how this can actually be achieved. The first is by having a national in data interoperability pol policy. In that policy, uh, we can uh, have uh, un uh, uniform data standards at which the different departments of the government have to maintain data. Uh, the other thing is um, uh, that there should be data exchange protocol, how, how governments uh, exchange the data with either uh, inter-ministry inter or with, with the private, that should, al that should also be laid down in clear terms. The other is uh, that we, we can establish uh, the data sharing agreement inter within the government. So if, the, if one department of the government wants to exchange citizen data with other part of the department of, of the government, that should be done in very clear terms. And, and in terms of contract, who shall uh, who would be uh, live, who would be responsible for holding the data? What data would be uh, shared between the departments? If the data is breached, who would hold the responsibility? That should also be laid down in very clear terms. Uh, so once we were looking at the recommendations and the challenges, uh, these were some of the outcomes that we wanted to achieve to ensure that India has a robust infrastructure that does not impact the service delivery to the last mile and that we reach out to every person. And um, these are just some of the points that we could think of and our paper is still under the way, so we would want recommendations and yeah. your views on it. Yeah, basically, uh, we would like to stay, to our, stay true to our own selves by including the feedback mechanisms in our own paper and presentations. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll take questions and then uh, go to the next. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to understand if you explored the role of uh, uh, big corporates playing, uh, uh, you know, in terms of big data. Like if you look at either the Agri Stack or India Stack, a lot of this database is, uh, you know, MOUs are being signed between uh, the department. Say, for example, Agri Stack is being signed between Department of Agriculture and say Microsoft. So in these kind of scenarios. Uh, what are your views in terms of how the data could possibly be used? Uh, is that something that you've explored? Because it is meant for providing you know, digital services for farmers, but uh, on the other hand, it could also be used for uh, commercialization as well. So just wanted to know if you've explored that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my uh, it's more than a, I mean, it's not a question, it's more like a comment. Uh, can I suggest that maybe, I don't know if you have taken a look at uh, the national data sharing and accessibility policy. 
so maybe so there is also there is a policy framework that already exists uh, for data sharing within government and with government and uh, other organizations institutions public and there is what is happening in the uh, in the real world uh, whether it's happening in practice or not so you you are giving the example of the ayushman bharat uh, scheme so maybe i'm just suggesting the paper will get a <laughs> greater focus if you can see how one individual's data is being collected and used across the entire value chain of that ayushman bharat now i think maybe that would give you better uh, recommendations and an idea that okay you know this is how data has been collected stored and used so that's the uh, only comment yeah thank you um uh, thank you uh, very much for your excellent presentation i uh, wanted your thoughts on a couple of things one is uh, uh, consent uh, from the citizens or the beneficiaries uh, particularly um, with respect to health data what are your thoughts on that and also the second one is on the sunset clause that is expiry date for a for the health data or any data um, so what are your thoughts on that and uh, uh, have you looked at fhir uh, fast healthcare interoperability resources uh, it's called hl7 organization is called you can maybe take a look at that that's one suggestion thank you just a clari clarification did you look into the reliability or the quality of data or i didn't see anything related to that you know because we see that when you are talking about such a large scale data and sources and the way of collection that you are talking about there should be something about the reliability of the data and also the quality of data because this is something in large data collections a question that is being raised several times so sir regarding the reliability and quality of data uh, we did uh, look into it the reliability and quality of data is obviously an issue in india what happens is uh, if i uh, talk about uh, the say health data in that matters so what happens is there should uh, again the data uh, the, the reason for the uh, poor quality and the poor availability of data is again that data exists exists in silos so there are different organizations that are collecting data in different ways so that is the reason why data is not the the quality of data is often questioned if there is there is a singular node node at which the data is um, collected and stored that would maybe uh, and, and again through the feedback mechanism and data analysis part that we included in the data cycle that through that maybe we can work on the data quality and again we would look in more deeply into the definition yes yes right yes sir sure um, again on the health, health data consent yeah on sorry on ma'am on the health data consent question uh, as i mentioned that citizens have to be uh, centered to the governance process in terms of health data uh, consent consent is obvi obviously uh, required but what is actually happening is uh, in terms of ab ab dmi again say this 34 crores data that is uh, unique ids that have been created have not been created by taking consent so many few, when i was actually uh, working on this project uh, regarding the uh, interoperability and uh, interoperability of health data uh, uh, then a uh, person working in the health ministry told me that uh, this actually exists and at that point of time we got to know that the the abdm the unique ids that were created were created through paytm they were created through covin registration when we when citizens registered for their uh, covid vaccination at that point of time their uh, unique ID, ids were created and therefore the consent was not present as such so we would uh, it would have been a ideal position to involve citizens in the process let them know that your that your data is being collected how is it, how is it going to uh, affect you is it in positive obviously in the in the positive way government would say and uh, how are we going to stay what is, what are we going to do that could have that should have been uh, known 
the government should have uh, let the citizens know about the consent part of it as well. Yeah. And just to add on to what he said that uh, one of the problems that we share with the personal data protection bill was that the bill had become so complex from the government side that it was so difficult to read for a common man. The bill had become about everything except about data. It had all these jargons that were very difficult to understand as well. And one of the reasons why government decided to pull the bill back was that because they were being told that they had not done enough stakeholder consultation. and they, idea of consent, like he mentioned, was not there. A big giant company still today can access your data. I think the new bill uh, does talk about data minimization and data localization for Indians. But again, the idea of consent is not mentioned because stakeholders and the it's not been around citizens. Again, data is being looked at as an end that the government is trying to fetch the data, but not as a means to um, become a more efficient uh, service delivery mechanism. Yes, we have two more questions. One was, uh, one was, uh, one was around uh, uh, the policy the that exists, and one was around role of the corporate big corporates. Corporate. Yeah. Do you want to take that? Please. Okay, so on the uh, agreement with governments, on the AgriStack, agri uh, we did not uh, We did, we did not, not narrow it down, narrow it down uh, to, to that part. Yet so to we'll definitely that. take your uh, suggestion into consideration. On, and on the uh, agreements with of government with the corporates, um, could you please repeat your question? <laughs> There's so many questions. I lost it. Sridhar. Yeah. No, so essentially the question was that uh, question there's a lot of uh, database being developed like for example there is a farmers database which is the agri stack it has about 50 million farmers data in terms of sensitive data like soil health or uh, amount of seeds that were used or fertilizer data or also the yield that the farmers got so now this entire database is being developed in uh, you know in partnership with Microsoft and soon other players like Amazon Cisco they are all coming into work with the government to uh, develop this database. So while it is uh, towards creating digital services for farmers, uh, the, the fact is that a lot of the consultations have not ha happened with the farmers in the first place, or farmer bodies. So I just wanted to know your thoughts around how are those MOUs created with these corporates and if this kind of data can also be used for commercial purposes. So the question is around data usage when it comes to interacting or having these kind of MOUs with corporates to develop uh, these kind of data stacks? Uh, so we have not narrowed it down to that specific area. Yeah, this was just an example. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I get, but we have not narrowed it down there, but I think you have a valid point in terms of how this data can be commercialized because, again, the person whose data it is was not informed. His consent was not taken or given. So he doesn't know if the government even has the data for what purpose it is being used. So that is a gray area that we are yet to explore, but I think we'll take your recommendations and we can work on it. Can I uh, add a, okay. There is a feeling that, you know, due to the new technologies that are being employed and multiple agencies being employed to collect the data, Many of the lower level units have become data collection units and data transmission units and the data that they collect are not utilized for any decision making. So it goes against the decentralization process that has in some form or the other taken little, I will not say deep roots, little roots, you know, even that is getting weakened in the process of the new arrangements, multiple agencies, because it has become commercialized. Collecting data and providing data has become the yeah. livelihood of many organizations, you know. Mm -hmm. So that has become, that has certainly adversely affected the process of use of data where it is being collected. Yeah, can I add one or two questions, uh, basically building upon? See, one, and I think those are larger questions. It's, it's, I think it's not, again, going back to the whole uh, political economy of that. So, for example, see, beneficiary or citizen, I don't think they are the same thing. And that actually determines your choice. So, I, you know, when we are talking of data, especially use of technology, are we looking at people as beneficiaries or are we looking at them as citizens? 
you know, we, we all talk of transparency, accountability, and, and participation, and democratic principles. But in the end, we all treat people as beneficiaries. So, so there is a problem in that, and I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to address the issue of, of data being citizen-centric without referring to that basic questions. Have, have people remained citizens, or are they treated as citizens or not? So that, that's one aspect. Second is, uh, she referred to, you know, she had a visual, actually, when she was talking to, that you have all these dashboards in front of you. So, uh, and, and that, uh, what Professor Varghese is referring to in terms of, you know, uh, uh, collect, use of data. So what we are seeing across the states, actually, that it's much more used for monitoring at your level. It has nothing to do with planning. Those are two different things. Uh, and, and, when you, and also for greater centralization. So certain things that were being decided now because of data, and since it's assumed, uh, I mean, how far true is, is a different thing. It's assumed that data-based planning is better. The role of elected agencies, el uh, elected uh, uh, governments, uh, at, at lower levels is being reduced because, you know, we are based on data we are planning. So why should panchayat plan for itself or why should municipality plan for itself? So those, those, and those are all linked. It's not that they are disparate points. Similarly, on the name of, uh, you know, uh, efficiency, uh, you bring in many things which are actually uh, controlling, which are for particular uh, reasons. Uh, we, we all have uh, heard about uh, uh, say certain hunger deaths that happened in Jharkhand. Uh, uh, because you excluded, based on uh, data, you excluded thousands of families from uh, PDS. Uh, uh, so it's, it's also, so, and, and exclusion is not taken as a violation of citizen right, it's actually taken as an example of efficient governance. So I think there are certain basic principles that one needs to go into before coming to the details of, you know, management. And one of the things that, uh, uh, again, this fa the fact that we have several dashboards which don't talk to each other. See, for example, if, I mean, we just did one uh, last mile delivery uh, uh, mm, mm, study in Rajasthan. So you have, uh, uh, you have Aadhaar, you have Jan Aadhaar, you have some other Aadhaar, and, and they are all linked to each other. Still, you have to fill all those and produce certificates every time you apply for mm -hmm. anything. And that, I don't think, again, is innocent. You know, there is a political economy of it, why you have so many dashboards which don't talk to each other, why you have repeated data of the same citizen uh, as, as, you know, she could be a beneficiary here, she could be a beneficiary there. And, and uh, taking technology as, as you know, uh, uh, as the main route to efficiency without looking at issues of citizens' rights, inclusion, exclusion, there, there, so there is a larger uh, issue there, which needs to be discussed before we uh, come to data management, I feel. One sentence, like, just to completely agree with Joseph. I think, I think, again, the premise of what you're saying is really useful about, so I like the terminology of <laughs> citizen-centric governance and data, what was it, data governing, gov 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 governing by data. By data. Yeah. Um, but in your recommendations, and I think that's a good example of saying, do a case study because everything that you're saying, in some ways, everyone knows, but there's a reason also why it's not the way it is. Um, if government wants to, COVID being an example, in some ways, think about it. In a short span of time, you got crores of people's data, you got people to self-register, and when we went in to get our shots and injections, in some ways, we have to provide very little information because they already had that information, right? So the ability is there, but there are reasons why some of your recommendations won't work. Um, not because they aren't important, but because there is a political economy side of it. I've had state governments saying that the own, our own data that we are sharing with the union government, we're not getting APIs for that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. There is a centralization question. There is a discretion question as well. Now you have data entry operators where actually a positive way of also managing data where sometimes if you're not in a list, which is a centralized list, but actually you should have been in that list. Sometimes by having a little bit less 
um, rigid rules, you are able to get people onto lists that typically would not fit into it. So I think maybe do a case study where you actually follow that data piece up the chain and talk to some people because I think that's where you can also give the other side, which is mm. this is ideally where we want to go, but it's also important to recognize some of the constraints that Jyotsna mentioned and what we've also seen on the ground. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, not a question, uh, just more of a suggestion than a question. Uh, so I just recently finished a project on pharma-centric data governance and I noticed your presentation. Thank you for such an exhaustive presentation and a comprehensive one. Uh, what I th think was missing was uh, the different types of data governance models which are existent, like let's say your data collaboratives, data cooperatives, data fiduciaries, data trusts, indigenous data sovereignties. And like how ma'am said previously, you could do a case study on that and add it in your uh, report or your paper. Just a suggestion. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sneha and Path. Um, so there is a phone that has been left on the chair. Can you? Is it? Is it yours? It's an MI2 phone? It was left in the last chair. Oh, it does. Oh. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, the final presentation for today is our very own Saumya and Abida. Uh, they are going to be presenting on does child-friendly gram panchayat mean good governance? Take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Abeda, and this is Samya. We'll be presenting on a topic uh, titled, like, paper titled, Does Child Friendly Gram Panchayat Mean Good Governance? So, what we tried, what we attempt to do in this paper is that we analyze 10 gram panchayats in Karnataka uh, in terms of their uh, how fun well functioning they are in their child friendly governance and in their overall governance. And we try to just oppose them together to see if there are any patterns emerging and if there can be any findings to be f found. So uh, before uh, going to the uh, details of the study, so I'll just set a context first. So as in like we all know, most of the people here would know, like uh, the Panjaiti Raj uh, Act was uh, introduced based on the 73rd Constitution Amendment Act. Uh, in order to uh, bring the state a little more closer to the people, uh, in terms of uh, like it has high ambitions, like you know, improve the participation of people in governance, like to settle the local problems more efficiently locally, and to uh, increase political awareness, etc. Uh, and uh, GPs as uh, gram panchayats as local uh, institutions of local governance also was um, vested with like a very ambitious and like huge responsibilities such as like ensuring poverty alleviation, uh, delivery of all the welfare services, uh, provide health and well-being to rural people, providing drinking water, etc. So in this um, paper, we will uh, definitely particularly focus on one uh, functions that is one function that is empowerment of women and welfare of children, and in that also welfare of children specifically. So um, as I said, what we are trying to attempt is to look at assess the child-friendly governance as the, and the overall governance in the panjaits. So um, you know, before uh, presenting our own framework, I have to uh, mention that there are existing framework of analysis, um, like the, what the state is doing in terms of analyzing both overall governance and the child-friendly governance. For example, this Gra Gandhi Gram Puraskar Award is a framework that is used to analyze the efficiency in the state and centrally sponsored schemes. And uh, Mission Antyodhya is a national level framework to assess uh, like um, the uh, resource utilization in Gram Panjait level. And Child Friendly Gram Panjait Award is a specific award, especially uh, for assessing child related governance in a Panjait. 
but we will not be assessing these panchayats, 10 panchayats based on the framework that is used by the state uh, due to one particular reason that I'll explain right now. If we look at the indicators that have used uh, by this assessment framework, like say if we take child-friendly Gram Panchayat Award as an example, we can see that the indicators are a combination of both outcome indicators and process indicators. And what do I mean by outcome indicators and process indicators? Say for example, uh, in Child-Friendly Gram Panchayat Award, it takes an indicator called immunization rate. So um, like ensuring immunization, full immunization is a function that is assigned to the panchayat. And that is why the indicator used is immunization rate. But the problem here is that immunization rate is a characteristic of a panchayat as a geographical area. Uh, so, uh, whoever contributing to that could be like uh, the health systems, uh, health service delivery systems in the panchayat level, or like, uh, uh, but the direct involvement of panchayat in ensuring that uh, immunization rate is higher or lower cannot be guaranteed. Like we can't attribute that directly to the uh, Gram Panjayat as an institution. So if we are uh, assessing Gram Panjayat an institution of local governance, we should assess the process and how the Gram Panjayat, what is the role of Gram Panjayat in ensuring these functions. So based on that, we have uh, created an alternate, different, more comprehensive framework to analyze uh, Gram Panjayats, both in terms of child-friendly Gram Panjayat and uh, uh, child-friendly governance and the overall governance. But before that, I will uh, just introduce the 10 panchayats we will be uh, looking at in this paper. So they are Marwandi, Laila, Melege, Panjanahalli, Malangi, Palibatta, Rajanakunde, Somanahalli, Shiragupi, and Radhanur Naganur. So these 10 panchayats actually were selected uh, based on the recommendation of RDBR as uh, these are the 10 gram panchayats. They identified as child-friendly grammar panchayats based on the different child-friendly initiatives that was conducted in these panchayats, like such as building transportation facilities or digital libraries, or et cetera. So in this uh, sample, we have also tried to include panchayats from all the different geographical zones and like with a large variation in terms of geographical area, population, et cetera. Uh, so uh, from that, we will, uh, I will try to explain our new framework a little more uh, in detail. So what we have in terms of both child-friendly governance and overall governance, what we have tried to do is like analyze the panchayats in four major themes. That is the first one is like there are certain functions that is assigned to the gram panchayat as an institution uh, by the uh, uh, ministry of, like Gram Suraj Act, Karnataka Gram Suraj and Panchayat Raj Act. So uh, like in terms of uh, child-friendly governance, the uh, functions that is assigned to them is like, for example, ensuring universal enrollment of children in primary school or achieving universal immunization of children. But what we have tried to do differently here is instead of trying to take immunization rate as the indicator, what we have tried to do is like what is the role of Gram Panjayat in ensuring uh, immuni like higher immunization rate? Whether the Gram Panjayat have taken an active role or um, uh, in terms of like building proactive measures, are, have they taken any proactive measures? Or if they have like supported the measures that are taken by the schools or like health centers, or if they have no roles at all. Like based on that, each uh, indicator, like under each theme, we have selected different indicators, and in each indicator, all gram panchayats are scored from score one to three. Like if they have no role, they were scored one, and if they had like a very proactive role, they had a, a score of three. And the other uh, theme which we have selected is the institutional processes. Like uh, there are also the same act, the Gram Suraj Act also stipulates certain uh, institutional structures that aid the um, functionings, or aid these functionings. Say for example, uh, social justice standing committees. These are all mandatory com standing committees in a panchayat level to, uh, to assist, uh, assist this carrying out of these functions. So. Uh, so uh, there are like different kind of functions. Some are general fun uh, general uh, institutions such as panchayat general body, or some are like child specific institutions, uh, women and child trafficking and child marriage. Some subcommittee will be an example. 
So uh, we try to, what we try to look at is in the institutional process is like, uh, we try to see if these meetings, if these committees are formed, uh, very basic. Uh, and the second level, if the committees are formed, whether there is, uh, the proceedings are uh, uh, properly maintained, if the meetings are conducted regularly. But on the third level, we also look at if the committees indeed discuss the issues of children, like if we are assessing the child-friendly governance. So in terms of Panjait general body meeting, by looking at the their meeting minutes, we see if the Panjait general body meeting actually do whether they discuss the issues of children. So by that time, again, this is also graded into, all the panjayats were graded into, graded from one to three. And there, we also looked into the institutions such as Bal Vikas Samiti, School Development Monitoring Committee, Village Health Nutrition and Sanitation Committee. Now these committees are not exactly the committees under panjayat, uh, so, uh, but these are by the line department, Department of Education or, um, uh, or like, um, WCD, Women and Child Development Department, etc. So, but we have also included this in our discussion because Panjayat member are also part of these in, uh, committees. And in, instead of just looking at here also, instead of just looking at whether these committees are formed and uh, um, is the meetings conducted regularly, we try to specifically look at what is the role of Panjayat member in that, whether the Panjayat member actively participate in these committees or not. So um, the uh, third indicator is uh, financial indicators um, in terms of like what is the percentage of fund allocation. Um, and we used percentage of fund allocation in terms of action plan. Um, we have discussed that fund allocation is not the best uh, method uh, so far, but uh, why, why? Because it also shows the intent as um, uh, Avni was saying before. Uh, then we also uh, use another theme of citizen participation because um, as I discussed, as I said earlier, for local governance, the uh, largest aim was to bring the um, governance, the state a little closer to the people. So citizen participation is a very important factor in that sense if you are analyzing a local governance institutions. So uh, for child-friendly Gram Panjait, we have Makla Gram Sabha, which is a um, structure which is present in Karnataka where like uh, children are gathered together and like the conceptualization is as such whether uh, how it is done we will look at it we will present what we have seen okay, children in yeah children's grams so uh, so like uh, it is a platform where children are gathered together and like seen uh, they can raise their concerns and directly participate in the governance process so in terms of like assessing overall governance also, we use um, we use the very similar theme patterns mm -hmm. because these are largely the uh, qualities we would look for in uh, uh, overall governance also. In terms of financial indicators, we have used more uh, indicators than uh, child-friendly governance because uh, just the fund allocation alone will not give a proper picture of uh, financial structure of a gram panjait or in an overall ground structure. So we have uh, used like if the, uh, like uh, like for example, uh, percentage of property collection on to demand, percentage utilization of, utilization of grants again, and then like all these processes also and whether these documents such as action plans, budget documents are like properly maintained. And uh, in terms of citizen participation, we have looked at two different uh, um, institutions. One is Gram Sabha and one is Jama Bandi meetings. Jama Bandi meetings are meetings where financial processes are explained or accounted to the local people at the end of the year. So uh, we have looked at these uh, three, uh, these four themes and like indicators. Uh, in, in order to uh, like assist comparison and all this, we have develop, developed a small calculation index scoring process and all just to uh, assess um, like, you know, help to compare and put them in positions. So, so the uh, process, ranking process is done based on like, we have sub indicators and in each sub indicators, as I mentioned, these GPs are scored in one, two, three, and the GP then uh, in, in one theme, the total score of the GP is calculated and then the percentage score is calculated so that each GP have similar weightage in terms of total, each theme have similar weightage in terms of total allocation. And then like that percentage score is then divided by four so that 
a tw uh, index score of 20, uh, index score in each theme out of 25 is uh, like assigned to a panchayat. And then based on that rankings are done, like a total score is added and based on that the rankings are done. Uh, so maybe uh, if I give an example of Radar Nagarnur Panchayat, so there are 10 indicators under the first theme. So the GP scored like two, 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 one, different number of uh, in each indicator. The total score was 17, and which is actually the 56.67 percentage score in terms of just carrying out the functions uh, aspect. And in terms of, uh, and then that will be a 14.17 index score in 25. And we calculate index score for all the all the different themes. That is 14.17, 11.9, 16.67, 16.67. .67. We get a total index score of Red or Nagnor as 59. So this is the basic uh, premise methodology we have used. And what we have seen, uh, what we observed uh, in this 10 gram panchayat, uh, Samia will explain to you. Uh, thank you, Abhida. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, in this slide, like uh, like we are going to show you the analysis of indicators to assess the child friendliness in 10 gram panchayats. Um, like when we see the overall ranking, uh, uh, Marwante and Rajanakunte are uh, taking the first and second place, and uh, Laila and Shirugupi has ranked last. And when we look at the functions of GP only three out of 10 uh, panchayats were taking proactive measures. And uh, also when we look at the, how they are monitoring school, uh, school Anganwadi or PHC, uh, none of the 10 GPs were actively monitoring or providing support uh, during the implementation of a scheme or a program. And also GP have performed very poor uh, when it comes to the collection and updating of the child related data. Only six out of 10 GPs uh, did not maintain proper documentation of child related data. And even uh, GPs were, data was being uh, collected, maintained properly, that uh, the data has not been used uh, during the planning or the implementation of the scheme or the program. Um, when we look at the institutional uh, structure or like process, uh, it was observed that uh, the general body meeting as conducted regularly and the child related issues are low frequently they are, uh, they are, they were discussing. Although uh, Karnataka uh, Pan uh, Panchayat Raj Act mandated formation of social justice committee, uh, com uh, committee, this is the one of the uh, major, uh, sorry, uh, this is the, uh, sorry, uh, one of its major agenda uh, point being the welfare of uh, women and children. Uh, only uh, three gram panchayat has formed this committee, and uh, those uh, gram panchayat also they have clubbed clubbed this committee meeting with the general body meeting, and they are not maintaining any proper proceedings also. Uh, okay, and. Uh, like uh, as uh, Abhida told, like uh, GP level institution also has to form subcommittees like SDMC, uh, Balvika Samiti, and BHSNC. Uh, like they are uh, regularly conducting the uh, meetings and the documentation is also uh, they are well maintaining. But only in one GP, like we were able to see the uh, president participation in the meeting and the issues was discussed during the meeting that was also discussed in the general body meeting. Uh, okay. Mm, okay. Uh, Makkala Grama Sabha, uh, like uh, all the um, Gram Panchayat have conducted the Makkala Grama Sabha, but uh, four out of 10 Gram Panchayat has, uh, has uh, mm, proceedings have not been systematically documented only three uh, panchayats followed up the issues that has been raised during this Makkala Grama Sabha. Uh, and this, this can be indicated that like Makkala Grama Sabha has not been very, uh, has seen a very limited success rate. How many more slides do you have? Uh, I have uh, two more. 
do more. Yeah, man. Try to do fifty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Especially focus on the main points, the relationship okay. that you hmm. are exploring. Yeah. Uh, basically, like we have res referred action plan uh, to know the allocation uh, related with children. Uh, and then largely like uh, it was limited to the infrastructure infrastructure uh, like for example uh, uh, school and anganwadi constructions providing drinking water and and toilets uh, apart from this gp also used their own source revenue to provide scholarships uh, provide uh, transportation facilities to the uh, school going children okay um uh, as seen as seen in this table, Rajanukunta and Marwante GP has done well in uh, terms of overall ranking. On the other hand, Radde Naganur and uh, Pali Beta has uh, taken the ninth and tenth place, and uh, Pali Beta, Marwante, and Shirgopi has uh, are the uh, three GPs that uh, have uh, fairly fairly well discharged their functions, has listed in Schedule One of the Act. Uh, uh, then, uh, a majority of the remaining GPs have listed taken reactive approach and expected GP level institution to highlight any issues or support that they may need. Okay. Okay. Uh, when we look at the institutional process, uh, GP, like general body meeting, other uh, subcommittee meetings, they are uh, conducting regularly. But when we look at the Karnat um, KDP meeting, like Karnataka Development Program, that has been, like Karnataka has mandated to conduct this, this uh, meeting uh, once in a three months. And also this meeting helps uh, GP to introduce, to uh, formalize the inter uh, interaction between uh, line departments and uh, Panchayat Raj institutions. Only uh, three Gram Panchayat have uh, done, uh, like they have organized this meeting, but they have not properly uh, maintained the proceedings or they have not maintained the uh, documents. Mm, okay. Uh, when we look at the like citizen partnership, uh, according to the Panchayat Raj Act, um, G um, GP has to conduct two uh, Gram Sabha meeting, but only two out of ten uh, Gram Panchayat have conducted regularly this Gram Sabha meetings, and this uh, this data like we got from the audit by referring the audit report. Uh, apart from this, like they you uh, they once in a year, like they need to do the Jamabandi 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 meeting, where they are um, it's a it's it's a kind of social auditing, and that also like uh, they are not done in a like stipulated time. Mm. Okay. Uh, when go we look at the final, slide. go to your final slide. Hmm. Okay. Where you are comparing? Okay. Huh? Whether overall governance and child friendly, you know that that's the yeah. thing that. Do they have any relationship? Okay. Because uh, time, you know, we didn't give others time, so let's stick to that. Okay. Uh, in this figure, the first quadrant of the graph shows the uh, panchayat that has not performed well in uh, child-friendly governance and overall governance, and the third quadrant shows the panchayat performed well in both. Uh, in like by looking at this uh, quadrant, like we can we are able to see that Rajanakunti and Marwante ranked high, highly not not only in just in uh, child friendly governance, also in overall governance, and Somana Hali is another GP which performed equally well in both child friendly governance and the overall governance. On the other hand, uh, Radde Naganur and Shiragupi GPs which are not ranked very highly in uh, child-friendly governance or not fairly well in overall governance. However, a few GPs like Mal, uh, Melige and Pali Beta have thrown some interesting contradictions. Uh, by this, I would like to conclude that child-friendly governance goes hand-to-hand -hand with overall governance of the Gram Panchayat. The outliers in the study present contradictions to the popular conclusion, but it should be noted that the reason for the contradiction is due to lack of prioritization of child-friendly participation at the GP level and overall poor data management practices. This does not take away from the uh, fact that child-friendly GPs are the ones with good governance structure promoting 
discussions and highlighting the importance of the idea of decentralization. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I just have two questions. Um, one, on the functions of GP, um, how did you rank the panchayats into one, two, and three? Was that self-reported or, I mean, based on self-reported data, or did you make that judgment call? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, and the um, second question is, I think multiple themes are there and um, uh, functions of GP, it's a categorical uh, variable. But finance, financial performance, it looks like a continuous variable kind of a situation. Can we all put, I mean, can we put this all together into one single index? I don't know, I'm methodologically, I'm not sure if that is possible or if it's possible then, you know, uh, just want to clarify that. Um, yeah, that's all. Looking at your scattergram, I'm happy to see that. Supposing I start from that side, you define your two uh, indices of child friendliness, good governance, and so on. Then you have this relationship. And I think there was one Ram Panchayat at the top, starting with a P. I couldn't quite make Pani, out. Pani but, it, but if you leave that one out, if you leave there as an outsider, I mean, outlier, I can come back to that, then you have a pretty much linear relationship which you yeah. get going across very easily. Now, if you take that linear relationship, you're saying the two indices are related, where you have good governance, you also have child governance, which is good, and vice versa, if you are bad, and so on. Now, the question is, so if you come to that straight away, then you, then you have interesting questions to ask. There is a relationship, and now you ask yourself, why are some performing better, or why are some performing worse? But whoever is doing better is also doing better at both, who is not doing better is doing worse at both, but why are some doing better, some would, the question changes question changes in a way. So I think it's, it's worth exploring in that way. You spent a lot of time in the construction of the indices, which is very useful for us to, to look at. Mm. But maybe it, you can invert it, put it on its head, mm. and ask the question in this way. There's a very clear relationship. Mm. And then if that, given that, then you can actually go to that outlier. There is something about that P. Well, you could, Pali beta. Yes, what is happening there? There is something unusual going on. Why is it un, you know, unusual? So I think that kind of a discussion would be useful. Yeah. Very, very good, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Aishriya from Public Affairs Center, and I'm doing a similar study on uh, the role of activity analysis and time utilization of the panchayat development officers uh, in uh, GPs in Karnataka. So uh, thank you for a good presentation, uh, Biba and uh, Soumya. Uh, so uh, my, I had two suggestions. One is, uh, uh, why did you not consider multidimensional poverty index? That is also important as the same as Gandhi Gram Puraskar because multidimensional poverty index considers standard of living uh, in terms of poverty, it considers health uh, parameters it con in terms of mortality, it considers nutrition in terms of stunted, wasted uh, and other parameters. So I, uh, my uh, sincere suggestion is uh, you include uh, MPI as well in this calculation. My second thing is uh, I wanted to know if you interviewed any of the panchayat development officers in any of your 10 GPs because they are the prime, uh, they are the main players in the Gram Panchayat, in any Gram Panchayat across 5,650 uh, Gram Panchayats which are present in Karnataka. So they have, uh, they have about 250 activities, but if you go to the GPDP, there are only 29 subjects. But if you see an uh, overall picture, they have about 250 roles and responsibilities, differing from administration related roles, line department scheme related roles, which uh, comes under WCD, which uh, in terms of, um, revenue and etc. So I suggest if you have not uh, inclu uh, interviewed the PDO that you do some case study on PDOs to understand better as to uh, the nuances in women and child. So thank you. Uh, so to respond to like uh, certain questions like the first one is uh, um, one is that there is a linear relationship, and if there is a linear relationship, why are certain uh, GPs performing well, and why are not certain GPs not performing well? 
so uh, like the study was not intended like that but then if we see uh, it seems like a direct relationship because those panchayats which uh, will perform which have a very uh, more uh, what do you say like more decentralized or more democratic structure where there is better data management overall will also definitely have better data management in terms of children so uh, this goes hand in hand like um, it's a overall characteristic of a panchayat as an institution so that's how we analyze it but in terms of why we will have to like look at it separately only and, go back and, outline. and then yeah right right uh, and then the uh, other thing uh, uh, sorry i forgot your name uh, so uh, in terms of multi dimensional poverty index why if we have used in fact we have not used any of the framework even the mission andyodhya framework or uh, any of the framework we have not used multi dimensional poverty index also because these are all outcome indicators as i was suggesting and we were not looking at gps as a geographical area the cluster of villages like whether they are performing well or not but instead on the institution and as an institution of self governance if they were performing well or not and uh, we thought uh, come indicators will not be a good measure to assess these things so uh, in terms of interviews we have conducted actually we have conducted interviews of pda uh, sorry yeah yeah uh, like uh, as part of a cbps studies in, in terms of like child related uh, governance um, innovative child related governance so uh, in and the other thing do you want to take the first question yeah okay uh, the first question was reg regarding the functions of the gp and the financial uh, thing see in the functions of gp also like we have uh, we have uh, like we have done the interviews like we have uh, interviewed the uh, gp president pdo and uh, in uh, school also we have interviewed uh, um block uh, uh, block block education officer and uh, high school uh, headmaster pre, uh, 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 primary school headmaster and uh, in anganwadi also like we have interviewed uh, 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 sup uh, anganwadi supervisor and the anganwadi worker and the anganwadi uh, teacher and uh, in phc like we have interviewed uh, anms uh, in this like in the functions of gp like what we have done uh, in this like we have not just uh, taken the variable as like are they uh, are only just going and visiting like we in the uh, like it's not only based on the like the, are they maintaining the proceedings or like are they uh, maintaining the data not only that in the during the interviews also we have asked the uh, asked these questions based on the uh, interviews uh, results like we have formed this like one two uh, three scale three is the best and the one is the worst one and for example like when when we are asking like management and monitor uh, monitoring of gp level libraries and reading uh, rooms it's like one uh, like the first uh, the first scale like we have given for the not functioning and the second scale is like function functional library but no regular maintenance and uh, the third one is functional library with regular maintenance and like they have a dedicated space also it's not like only in the one corner like they have done uh, like they have created the library like there is, is there is a like particular place like they have done they have done and it's not only like by asking like we have visited the library yeah huh. uh, and the financial thing want to add the study i mean uh, uh, the key uh, starting point was that this gram panchayats were awarded as child friendly so that is when we thought of like really what is that gram panchayat as an institution of local self governance is doing for this award have they really done for anything for this award is that what we started off with and tried to unpack this uh, for unpacking this we uh, looked into the records of the gram panchayat we looked into the proce meeting proceedings of these various subcommittees and also the various institutions under the gram panchayat i mean within the gram panchayat uh, geographical area and also traced it back to the actions taken by the gram panchayat suppose if there is a bal vikas committee or vhsnc uh, taking a decision related to children we are also try to trace it back with the 
general body meeting uh, resolutions if there are any actions being taken and further leading to any expenditure in the budgets. So action plan, budgets, minutes of the meeting, meeting proceedings, all of these have been analyzed for three years. Yeah. Yeah. So just to, I think, what uh, uh, I'm gathering from your response and their response, one is that it's not the self, uh, you know, your questions. That so it's it's they are ranking the research team based on their in indicators, and they are focusing on institutional processes, and and that's what they are ranking, and which also uh, which is based on textual analysis, the meeting things analysis, as well as observations, yeah. if I and understand. And the financial process also, we are not ranking, ranking based on the numbers. We are ranking like, are they maintaining the budget documents? Are they have taken the uh, approval from the taluk? And are they collecting the tax? Like, are they like property tax? Like, like are, is there any improvement in the collection? Like, are they able to reach out? Those are the like things, like it's not only the numbers, like we, uh, Based on the reports, everything like uh, we have uh, done, arrived, arrived at this. Study. So it's their efforts that you are looking at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No more questions? We can close. I just wanted to say, um, I think one, so great job. Um, I think one other paper that you guys should write now that every government likes ranking, um, and there are so many ranking, and one is often struggling with the methodology of the ranking. So since you've studied some of the um, current methods and you decided yeah. to create your own, another paper is putting out methods on how do you think about ranking, of how it's important to separate out processes and outcome mm -hmm. information, and uh, your findings of the existing methods. Mm -hmm. So that's our second paper that you guys need to write soon. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.